opera. It's, it's, um, it's a very interesting concept because in terms of when I came down on the sub, subway, there's a, a, um, an advertisement for the Metropolitan Opera and it said the voice must be heard. And it's a very interesting concept because the voice must be heard. There's an ephemeral moment in the final act of Puccini's La Boheme where neither melody nor words sound. Instead, you might know, but you might not know, that a soft mallet strikes a Turkish symbol. But most of us have never heard this silent moment or even realised it exists. But with this fleeting sweep against a symbol, we may get the curves. You may not know this moment, it's so slight and so silent, but you will certainly remember this moment now because you have felt the agonising scream of Mimi's lover that follows it. In The Body and Pain, philosopher Elan Scari argues that physical, oh, well done, argues that physical pain resists language. It has no voice. When it at last finds a voice, he begins to tell a story. In 2015, the photograph of a paramilitary officer craving the lifeless body of a Syrian toddler saturated news cycles. As we know, the image reverberated across the globe. With this silent frame, the now iconic and unambiguous photograph symbolising the humanity of the refugee crisis engaged sounds of alarm. No? That's fine. In the immediate aftermath, multiple pledges of activism from politicians arose in chorus, donations surged in charity bank accounts, and artistic acts augmented activism. Twelve months later, with a voice as bracing as a siren, the toddler's father, Abdullah Kurdi, shattered deep silences. He told London's Telegraph, everyone claimed they wanted to do something because of the photo that touched them so much, but what is happening now? People are still dying, and nobody is doing anything about it. Scari's comment on pain, it has no voice, when it at last finds a voice, it begins to tell a story, helps us to appreciate a sequence of actions that is more challenging to deliver than it reads. This challenge is the conundrum, finding a voice, a voice that listens, and hopefully an empathetic voice to begin a narrative. But this narrative, this story, proposes that there is an ending. Abdullah Kurdi's comment draws us to this ending, asking us to consider how a story, this story, and the greater story has failed to find a conclusion. It's swirling in a dissonant chord, and it fails to cadence. And if you will, another sound metaphor, an echo chamber. The narrative for us today is the narrative of soft diplomacy. The participants of the echo chamber are our converted colleagues, the colleagues of our institutions who already attend cultural events, who already perhaps know Puccini's La Boheme. So a sidebar. The narrative and echo chamber are two fashionable <coughs> expressions surfaced during the past decade. Let us take a, a, a quick moment to refresh ourselves on what they mean and what they have come to mean and why they are part of our everyday vernacular. The speed of multi plot film news cycles has birthed what we call narrative journalism. A front page story which once exercised direct reportage typically reads an example, and I randomly cho chose from the New York Times on September 8th. The next slide. Raqqa in Syria. Every few minutes, a deafening boom. Then a whistle of artillery. Occasionally, the clatter of a pickup truck piled with soldiers advancing to the front line. The evocative soundscape in this news article recalls <coughs> the opening sentences of a work of literary fiction, inferring from the start the progression of a typical narrative sequence of beginning, middle and end. We could also return to Puccini. The musical thread of this journalism, this report, reflects the developing orchestration in an opera's overture. It increases, it builds in excitement, the elements come in. It could be the violin, it could be the flute, but this is the way the narrative of an opera begins. When used by news media, the echo chamber, on the other hand, is closely aligned with its acoustic meaning to donate the sensation when sounds reverberate in a hollow enclosure. This effect, when realised in the media, is a metaphor to explain occurrences 
where information or ideas are transmitted and reverberate back to participants in the same enclosure. Whether the participants congregate in traditional media or in online communities, these groups in the information circle form gated communities. The participants share in the same belief system. In this circumstance, potentially transformative ideas and information doubles, triples and quadruples in repetitive sound groups that hit solid walls. The experience lulls the participants of the circle to believing that progress is being made. But these brick walls also suggest that the intention is impervious to conversion. And what Colette said about results. We are looking for results. In this presentation, I leverage the sound metaphor of the echo chamber and the structure of the narrative as triggers to investigate how cultural acts of soft diplomacy enable various forms of reception to take place, arguing how individual acts contribute to specific stages in the dramatic art. Through a case study approach, I contend that the key to the effectiveness of acts of cultural diplomacy rely on a primary motivation of a dialogic approach, that is, the pursuit of Elaine Scarry's voice. By examining cultural activism as performative acts in this narrative, I, am, I aim to determine a set of procedural markers. To do this, I, I, I engage this conversation in already demonstrated acts to situate the contribution in a narrative that enables a climax, a climax that leads to an end, a conclusion, a conversion beyond the echo chamber. I use the adjective cultural in the more functional sense of the word that is dated to the later part of the 19th century. The definition highlights the performative aspects of identities through certain activities, as well as the cultural products of these communities that affirm and consolidate group identity. Australian economist David Trotsky identifies three main characteristics of cultural endeavours. Activities concerned involve some form of creativity in their production. They are concerned with the generation and communication of symbolic meaning and their output embodies, at least potentially, some form of intellectual property. By focusing on Trotsky's performative actions, I reflect on acts by participants who have stepped up. The following artistic representations highlight a failure of national and transnational responses to a crisis. These examples are a selection of elite cultural practitioners who have engaged in an activity of civic responsibility. An intuitive motivation of an act seeks to materialise an, in, an issue to enable a reception to take place, to implore, as we discussed, the participation of our voice, a different voice to enter the narrative. This dialogic act in soft diplomacy terms aims to sit, stimulate social activism and awareness. In narrative terms, this first step progression belongs to our overture, our opening chapter of our book. I suggest that we consider this activation through the notion of a symbol and investigate what the act of the symbol is capable or incapable of generating. I contemplate what philosopher Joseph Campbell proposes, that a symbol is an energy evoking and directing agent. My artistic self concurs with Campbell when he says that all the great and little symbolic systems of the past function simultaneously on three levels. The corporeal waking of consciousness, the spiritual of dream, and the ineffable of the absolutely unknowable, which actually sounds like the beginning of a film, the beginning of a fantasy, the beginning of something. So let us look at this opening overture and some examples which I describe. So let's look at our act one of cultural diplomacy. I call it the symbolic act. Chinese artist Ai Weiwei's biggest installation to date is now on show at the National Gallery in Prague. Entitled Law of the Journey, Ai Weiwei's expression is a 70 meter long inflatable boat with 258 oversized faceless refugee figures. The museum describes the exhibition 
as a multi-layered epic statement on the human condition, an artist's expression of empathy and moral concern in the face of continuous, uncontrolled destruction and carnage. At the opening, Ai Weiwei said, there's no refugee crisis, but only human crisis. In dealing with refugees, we've lost our very basic values. A second example in our Act One of symbolism transpired in 2016 at Art Basel. Likewise, in order to raise awareness of the refugee crisis and the cruel reality of war, Art Basel introduced activism to the world of art dealers and wealthy art collectors. The subtext of this act sought to claim the importance of art to participate in social actors. Danish artist Itzo enacted one project. In 2015, Ibi Itzo travelled to the Italian island of Lampedusa, the entry point into Europe for refugees travelling on boats from North Africa. Most people changed their clothes from the trip upon the boat's arrival. They left their old clothes behind. The artists collected the discarded garments, dipped them in bluish paint, printed them on paper and then he framed them in the driftwood that he found on the shoreline. Called the shedding, and here is an example on your right, the pieces were priced at 10,000 euro and were sold to collectors in the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, and Belgium. At the artist's request, the proceeds went to Doctors Without Borders. With this activist intent, Art Basel's project aspired to create a link between the visual art as an elite form of cultural expression and the everyday human reality of refugees crossing the Mediterranean into Europe. The works of art represent the materiality of the refugees' arrival and make visible the stark contrast between the harsh des destinies of refugees and the elite cultural world of art dealers and artists in Europe. It so materialised and paid the symbolic shedding of old clothes by the refugees, and he spoke to the refugees and their strong desire to leave behind the reality of war, of civil war in Syria. By presenting the works of art at Art Basel and pricing them as expensive works of art, it so created an unmediated connection between the elite world and the experience of refugees. But natural questions arise, and we're talking going back to the echo chamber. Were the artistic elites whose everyday lives are otherwise removed from the precariousness of the refugees' destinies, invited to take part in considering their roles beyond their purchase. Did Itzos, Hatch and Joseph Campbell's corporeal awakening lead to the possibility that the art collectors considered their responsibilities beyond their purchase to their civic, corporate or political actions in shaping the lives of the refugees? Did the artistic representations by Itzo and Ai Weiwei on the refugee crisis progress the failure of transnational responses to the crisis? I argue that each example can be cited as a converting example on acts of cultural diplomacy through their defined role as an act of, symbol act of symbolism, as an awakening, as the opening cause of an overture that paves the way for the next stage of exposition and the development of the accreting narrative. I remind ourselves and myself of Joseph Campbell's symbol as an energy evoking and directing agent <coughs> and the effect of the, the ineffable of the absolute unknowable. I open now the question of the echo chamber. Each act brought recognition through a symbolism to a group of participants, participants in a gathering similar to a chat room. However, neither act mitigated the underlying I issue, but I believe was successful in beginning the narrative, in finding Scarry's voice. So a second act in our narration, in the, in the humanitarian activism, I've only got a few more moments, so I will speed along. Imagine a small not-for-profit organisation based in London, it ran workshops in the refugee jungles of Calais in 2016. Imagine Calais was a two-month-long series of open arts and crafts workshops. After, sex, after a successful online fundraising campaign, the organisation was able to bring an array of art materials to get the workshop started. Every afternoon, 
the artist would set up an atelier at the Jungle Book Library. Long sheets of paper were hung on any part of the wall that could be found, and the population of young and old contributed. Fast forward to 2017. We are aware that the refugee camps in Calais have been demolished. Fast forward to the Edinburgh Festival of 2017, and an exhibition at the Fringe called Protestomy seeks to fulfill the commitment to use the artwork for political purposes, to protest, advocacy, and awareness. Protestamine is a record of the work done by Imagine and other grassroots organisations in the jungle. The creators taught French, English, music and art at the Jungle Book School. Protestamine features documentaries, maps, poems, painting, sculptures and, is and illustrations. This work is di displayed in makeshift shelters constructed just as they were in the jungle. The experience provided an interactive experience while emphasising the ethical limitations of this kind of witnessing. Most importantly, the exhibition reminded visitors that the refugees who formerly lived in the jungle have not disappeared, but are stuck in limbo throughout France or sleeping rough in Calais. It is a reminder of a human condition that is a silent voice. So the organisers of protesting were the voice of silence, of the voice of silence that don't make news items. Protestomy communicates an alternative narrative about the refugee crisis. Protestomy reminds us that the refugees should be viewed as political beings, not just victims or perpetrators, and posits its reminder as the postscript, the PS, of the gap of silence. Protestomy both records something about refugees in the jungle and engages with the problem of representing them in the current political or media content. And even though these interactions and these paintings are silent, they're also voices. This expositional stage of the narrative, a humanitarian activism, realised through artistic journalism, mediates a transition in our narrative. But I quickly leave, because of time, to our final act. In 2015, the Pakistani documentary filmmaker Shamin Abad Shinoy produced and directed A Girl on the River, The Price of Forgiveness. The film highlights the issue of honour killings in Pakistan. The film, as you may have well known, traces the story of an 18-year-old Saba who was shot by her relatives to redeem their family honour. She was dumped into a river. She miraculously survived to tell her story. The film won the Academy Award. One of the most encouraging outcomes that transpired was that the Prime Minister made a statement after the Academy Award. He said that he would look into the matter and he would work on honour killings. And he wanted to hold the first screening in Pakistan at his residence. On February 15, 2016, Prime Minister Nawaz met Ms. Obayed vowing to remain the stain of honour killings from Pakistan. The global spectacle of the Academy Award with its accompanying prestige value offered Mr. Abide the necessary platform. A sobering conclusion, an end to the narrative, an advocacy that is still on its way to becoming. So in closing, in assessing these cases, I identify that all three acts are necessary in the progression of narrative to enact a beyond the echo chamber conclusion. If we take Raymond Williams' argument, the culture is a process and not a conclusion, then I justify these stages of processes and as necessary agents in the progressive narrative. By identifying the qualities of an echo chamber experience to examine motivations and dialogue, we begin to recalibrate, become attuned to the notion of reverberation. We are reminded that a true echo is a single reflection of the sound source. The causal outcome of our first stage, which brings us back to our results, the causal outcome of our first stage of simple reason is unknowable. We don't, we don't know what will happen to those art collectors. We don't know if they will take that next step. The second stage of the transition progresses, making, but making a difference through an art of activism does not need to be as conclusive as we sometimes pressurise it to be. 
It is important for the cultural activity to consider, to find, and apply the activity within the possible and create awareness for the purpose of the existence and its activity for itself. And the activity for itself is its intellectual property. And it has to be very reverential to its own intellectual property. Because without the superiority or without the worth of the intellectual property, it cannot translate. And it must be mindful for the people who it has influenced and can influence. The trick is not to overvalue the reach and to appreciate the contribution as part of the narrative. Remember, the pain has no voice, but art can bring its voice. When it at last finds a voice, it begins to tell a story. We are reminded that the articulation of our cultural acts is a felt experience, transcribed by an artist's reflection. Despite media's attempt to engage our entities through narrative journalism, the numbing effect of constant super news has dulled our participation, to, our participation to react and activate. The artistic act can activate <coughs> the felt experience. As Einstein said, the most important function of art and science is to arouse and keep alive this feeling in those who are receptive. Thank you. So does anybody like to uh, open the floor? So this is, that's what, well that's an, an old slide that Professor Joseph Nye said. So sometimes it, it might be nice to remind us, the basic concept of power is the ability to influence others, to get them to do what you want. There are three major ways to do that, one is to threaten them with sticks. So you, you, you showed the first picture is the refugee. What is the affection on this one? For the first one, may see. A refugee for Shiva? <coughs> Say that again. First pic picture here, <coughs> your report here. Is this Syria from Syria? Syria. Someone is yeah. there. Did you, did you not see yeah, that? Yeah, I know this. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, can we go for scroll back? Thank you very much for, yeah. Yeah, for scrolling down. And this is um, for helping me out on this occasion. <coughs> We're going to be in the this one, yeah, yeah. Right, this one. But uh, this is far, uh, go a few years ago, maybe two, three years. Yeah. yeah. But now, present this moment, you know what happened in the world? You see the social media, the Rohingya Muslim, how to genocide, how to kill the innocent people, the children. Do you see? Think about Myanmar. this. Myanmar. Burma. Myanmar. Yeah, Burma. yeah. Burma. Do you see like this? This picture, you know, this. Uh, well, I think thousands I mean, of uh, Muslims <coughs> killing from the yeah. Myanmar government. Yeah. You know, this, yeah. This but one the, is I mean, people. Yeah. Why this this photo worked rather than any other photo is is because we know that the personal and the individual seems to work better and, uh, than than the mass, and we empathise and the psychologists have have. Um, done tests to say that we actually empathise more with, with the individual photo rather than many, many people. I, I know that, that these images, and, and this image was particularly striking because of, of its <coughs> personal sense of the personal, the sense of how it, it effectively depicted the humanity. And once we are faced with the humanity, and so that's, I frame this one because it brought so much attention and because it is so silent, even though it is, it is so silent and so vocal at the same time. So in order to give voice, that for me, that has, it resonates with, with, with so much sound. In any, yeah. Interesting, first thank you for an exquisite presentation. I think that the, the shall we say, imagery of the Rohingya and, and what's happening there yeah. is um, perhaps contrasted with the Do Aung San Suu Kyi's, shall we say, unwillingness to acknowledge that the media has its role to play. Uh, my understanding is that her, shall we say, reaction to this is just that the media's gotten wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that imagery, the visualization that we see, can in some ways help us to, to try to empathize with the other, or at least to put oneself in the shoes of the other. And I think when I think of cultural diplomacy, I think of trying first and foremost to 
to put oneself in the shoes of the other and then to think about culturally what this means in terms of our common understanding, our dialogue, how we learn from each other and the like. But with the Rohingya, my fear is that you know she received the highest prize for possibly give someone yeah. in, in terms of thinking about the, the, the real influence of, of, of culture and, and the real importance of diplomacy. And it flies, what she's doing, it flies in the face of that. It's a difficult circumstance, but I think what happens is a lot of cultures where journalists are, are secluded or are um, banned are to step in. And we've seen that in Syria, we've seen that in Egypt, we've seen that in the Sudan, where, where journalists are banned are to step in. And that's one of the interesting things because they're the only ones who are allowed to, to filter. This is obviously photojournalism, but um, the call is, is, is the artists can give voice to this where journalists are banned. Mm -hmm. And so there seems to be, um, in that sense, there's a sense of her own censorship of the media in, and trying to, to, um, to take over the, me the messaging of that not very well and, and um, because there is that divide between the political system and the military system and because the governments are divided because this, the country is divided mm -hmm. between and so she, she's, yeah, I don't know the motivation there but this is where an, an artist's eye can step in mm -hmm. and someone who we can't put all our eggs onto the I Weiwei basket but there are artists who would be able to step in and to be able to articulate that and whether that's a documentary filmmaker, whether that's a, a musician, whether that is 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 someone to bring light to it is yeah. is the way that, that but it is about sparking the voice and sparking the vibrations. A, a, a voice is formed by vocal cords and vocal cords of this one and I know that which I'm an opera singer and they, they resonate in a, at, at, at um, uh, little c it's about uh, at, at a it's 440 times per second but it, it's the resonance of that and how we keep on pushing the message and we have seen even uh, as we have seen in america the the call to artists since the new administration has been quite vocal and if you are seeing even at the lincoln center in in the last um in the last festival, in the Lincoln Festival, there was a lot of, of, of um, theatre, a lot of music that was, was politically based. And you're seeing that across, you're seeing it at the Park Avenue Armoury, you're seeing that artists are stepping into the gap that journalism actually cannot take the place of. And actually, I was at the Edinburgh Festival as part of my fellowship, and a lot of, the, a lot of these works were taken centre stage, which is kudos, and, to the artistic director who has programmed. But as I was trying to articulate, and this is the difficulty, is that the people who are going to the cultural events are the people who are working in areas um, that are they going to be able to make a difference? Yeah. And um, who is, how do we get, get outside of our theatres, outside of our, our very A-list art galleries? And, and, and you know, it's wonderful to make the gesture and the symbol, but I think they're important because without the symbol, you can't have the exposition, the development, and then you can't have the, the Academy Award winning film because they all are part of the sequence. I mean, what you're saying was on display at uh, Alice Tully Hall yesterday at the Oswald Freedom Forum. You had a number of um, human rights activists who used music. One man played the violin for Venezuela. Mm -hmm. uh, another man spoke and, and, and recited a poem. I mean, it, it was very moving. Yeah. Actually. There's a lot of really fantastic projects. There's the Nile project. Does anybody know about that one? No. Which is a wonderful pro project, and it gathers musicians from across the Nile. Because the Nile has got a problem with water, what they do is they have a representative musician on every country that in, connects with the Nile. And they gather together and they write songs and they, they um, um, perform in concerts, but also they have educational workshops. Mm -hmm. So they educate the people about the scarcity of water and the future of the Nile. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful project. So you'll have projects, artistic projects, that, that cross the divide between humanitarian and environmental um, workshops and, and um, advocacy, as well as providing 
a musical in or a, um, a felt experience. So the felt experience can give away, give way to the advocacy and to um, educating the next, the next um, generation. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to sharing um, your thoughts over the next two days and to um, exploring how we can um, progress our narrative. So thank you so much.